What springs to mind when I say Stoke on Trent? Stoke City. Spitfire. Ronald Bennett. Oak Eggs. Port Vale. Pottery industry. Pottery, the, the, pot, the pot banks, the pot that make the pottery, they make the cups and saucers. And... So not vampires then? No, definitely no for vampires. Oh, no. 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 Not that I've heard of, no. No, 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 no. I think of vampires with a lot of people around here look like the living dead. <laughs> <laughs>
came to the door and I knocked and uh, opened the uh, opened the huge stained glass front door, which uh, creaked open. Miles Rodievich, the grandson of Mrs. Rod, remembers her well. He still resides at number three, the villas. My grandma was uh, called Genya Rodievich and she ran this house as a boarding house. So upstairs she had tenants and these tenants were also East European originally, who'd obviously come to Stoke following the war and had then found work. So uh, she took in all sorts of people here and she crammed them in. There were sometimes three or four of these guys to a room. She told me that Mr. Mikakura, who had lodged with her for some time, had not been seen for a while. She invited me inside and showed me up uh, along uh, a very dark, dingy passage, and uh, rather gloomy. And then we came to the uh, bedroom door where Mr. Mikakura lived and uh, knocked on the door and um, no answer. And of course the door was locked and the decision was made that I would have to break the door down. The door was rather flimsy and uh, with one push on my shoulder, uh, it opened. You don't pay for that! I stepped inside, uh, fumbled for the light switch, but um, the light didn't work. Mrs. Uh, Rodovizevich was standing just behind me and said that uh, the gentleman didn't like electricity and he'd taken the bulb out. I shone my torch inside the room, a tiny, tiny room with just a wardrobe of bed inside it. I could see that there was something uh, in, in the bed under the covers. And a feeling of trepidation as I, I went towards it, pretty knowing for sure what I was going to find, but pulled it back. And in my torchlight, um, there of course was the body of uh, Mr. Nukakura. The body was cold. He'd obviously been dead for some time. There were no signs of any injuries, so it was a mystery as to how he had died, and I knew at that point that there would have to be a post-mortem. Around the body, John found several bags filled with a white powder. It turned out to be salt. What the reason was for this at the time, I had no idea. I walked over to the window. Outside, just outside on the flat roof, just beneath the window, I found a washing bowl. Uh, upturned, uh, but uh, under the washing bowl was a, a piece of human excrement which had had pieces of garlic clove stuffed into it. He turned his room into a shrine, um, crucifixes around the room, bags of salt, excrement, and all sorts of lovely things, you know. What would be the reason for garlic and salt? Mrs. Rod, she explained to me that Mr. Mikakura believed in vampires. When she said that, it all started to fit into place. John was ordered to do a thorough investigation on the unexplained death. He went to Burslem Library and checked out any book on vampires he could find in order to help his investigation. Some of the research that I did led me to believe that people from Mr. Mikikura's time uh, in Poland and the Ukraine often did find themselves believing in uh, vampires. The Slavic people have the richest vampire folklore in the world and their beliefs were passed down through the generations and instilled in their children at a young age. They believe that vampires were malevolent spirits, those who had sinned or who had been sinned against. They took over the dead and feasted on the blood of the living. My name is Leila randall Cond, and I'm a, a writer and an occultist from Stoke-on-Trent. Eastern European vampires were not sexy and they, they were not good looking and they did not sparkle. They were foul creatures. They were disgusting, revolting, smelly, bloated, rotting corpses. It was the influence of um, writers such as Bram Stoker who gave the, uh, the modern vampire its sexy, um, kind of good-looking edge. The old-fashioned vampires, the, the real vampires, the true vampires, if you like, were not like this at all. 
the the original vampire was thought to be the uh, the very troubled soul of somebody that could not go to heaven and did not want to go to hell that had escaped hell but just could not go anywhere else and so was stuck here on earth troubling the living Vampire folklore has become so ingrained in our society that the fine line between fact and fiction has become blurred. Personally, the stories that are said to have occurred close to home are the most fascinating. And what's really intriguing about the Vampire of the Villas is that just two years previous to that, and 40 miles away in Cheshire, two young ladies were referred to the doctor suffering from bite marks on the neck on the breasts, even though they didn't know each other, had both dreamt about a tall dark man entering their room at night. One of the girls pointed a finger at a young Romanian artist by the name of Laszlo. Subsequently, the doctor investigated and visited Laszlo. Laszlo became very defensive and claimed that he knew nothing about these attacks. The doctor shortly after that started experiencing rather strange phenomena that he heard voices coming from nowhere that were threatening him. His cat was killed and left on the doorstep. His wife woke up one night claiming that she was being throttled by freezing cold hands. Subsequently, the doctor did some research on the girls and found out that there was no medical reason for the condition they were in. The best thing and the only thing that he could do was to give both the girls a crucifix and a Bible. At that point, both the ladies became well. Laszlo was never seen or heard of again, or perhaps Perhaps he found a new home here in Stoke-on-Trent. The story didn't really quite end there because there was nothing on the body at the time that would give us a, a cause of death. And if so, of course, a post-mortem examination was carried out. And I got a call from uh, the coroner's office to tell me that uh, the cause of death had been asphyxiation. A pickled onion had been found lodged in uh, Mr. Mekikura's throat. It suddenly uh, occurred to me that it might in fact be a garlic clove. Keeping garlic in the mouth was considered a method of protection against vampires. Pungent smells such as garlic and excrement were believed to repel evil spirits. Bags of salt were also used to stop a vampire, as it was claimed that they were compelled to count every grain before moving on giving the victim time to escape. Now, a very, very ancient folkloric belief is that a spirit cannot enter a house, a dwelling place, a church, unless it is actually invited. Otherwise, it has to remain outside. Are we going to be safe in here? They need an invitation to enter a house. But once you invite the vampire in, once you say, yes, you can come in, the spirit can return any time it likes and this is where you get the the really heavy duty protection rituals because you can't uninvite this uh, this spirit into your house God. so this is where you get the crucifix you get the holy water you get the garlic you get the uh, the symbols the protective sigils drawn on walls this is to keep the spirits out I rang back and spoke to the pathologist. He re-examined what he thought was a pickled onion and of course found out that it was a garlic clove. So it was, of course, in a way, Mr. Mekikura's uh, belief in vampires which had caused his death. My name's Chris Buckland and I teach psychology here in Stoke. The vampire to him is very real, um, sufficiently that he's taking steps, physical steps, he's, he's putting garlic in his mouth. He obviously believes that, that will protect him. There are many things that, you know, in folklore that will protect you from vampires. Vampire is a manifestation of something that he's very fearful of and he's managed to, you know, put it into a picture and the picture is a vampire. Vampires are at large, I tell you, vampires. I mean, another way of looking at the situation is he might have, have a phobia of vampires. I mean, there's strong evidence that we learn phobias. You know, we learn to be phobic about something. So maybe in his childhood, he, vampires were, were actually presented to him and maybe the response of a parent was rather extreme and he would absorb that fear and take that with him from childhood into his adult life, whereby that fear would become exaggerated. And in a certain situation, that phobic response would be triggered 
and he would act very extremely. Fear makes us do strange things, but what caused Mr. Mikikura's obsession with vampires? Was it the stories he'd grown up with in Poland as a child? Had he seen some unexplained event? Or was he being haunted by demonic revenants? We'll never know. The truth he took with him to his grave. Well, who knows what was going through his mind. He really did believe in this sort of thing. That was obvious from what we found out. He was a very frightened, lonely man, and uh, it was a tragic end. And it may well have been that he saw something or imagined something um, that um, made things just that little bit worse than it was and tipped him over the edge. There's a lot of documented evidence suggesting how this chap died, but who can really say? I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, that a whole industry is built up. I mean, rather what we're looking at here, films on horror, horror films, and a whole lot of stuff going on, is based on basically our fear. But it's fear we're in control of. So we can actually have a fearful situation, but we feel in some control of it. And that maybe helps us deal with fear that we're not in control of.